Welcome to History at H9, a program about naval history from the Hampton Roads Naval Museum in Norfolk, Virginia, home of the U.S. Atlantic Fleet. Naval Station Norfolk faces the historic harbor of Hampton Roads. It is the largest military installation in the world, but 10 years before construction began on the base, much of the land and the harbor that the base is located on was the site of the Jamestown Exposition of 1907, a world fair that commemorated the 300th anniversary of the settlement of Jamestown by the English, and it was also the departing and returning point of the battle fleet of the United States Navy, which later became known as the Great White Fleet, due to the ships being painted white. The story of these two events are closely tied to the origins of Naval Station Norfolk and the development of America becoming a world power in the early 20th century. I would like you to take a moment to think about what your life as a sailor is like today. What are some of the jobs that you perform on ships today? What is the dirtiest job that you can think of that are done on ships today? Let's consider these questions as we step back in time more than a hundred years ago and examine what was happening in the world and with the U.S. Navy at that time. I'm Katherine Renfrew, and this is Voyage of a Lifetime, The Great White Fleet, 1907 to 1909, Episode 1, The Beginning. The surrender of Santiago by the Spanish to the Americans on August 12, 1898, and the signing of the Treaty of Paris on December 10 of that same year, gave the U.S. a new role as a world power. The U.S. acquired their first overseas colonies, Spain's former colonies Guam, the Philippine Islands, and Puerto Rico, and they gained sovereignty over Cuba. This event and others leading up to the beginning of the 20th century marked a change on how Americans felt about themselves as a country. The aftermath of the Civil War, westward expansion, the Industrial Revolution, and the Spanish-American War all ushered in a new sense of patriotism. Americans were confident and optimistic. However, these same events created social unrest that marred America's newfound optimism. Foreign relations between Japan and the United States was marked by increasing tension. Each country now had territory and interest in Asia that they were concerned about, and U.S. treatment of Japanese immigrants and competition for economic and commercial opportunities in China also heightened tensions. In addition, the Russo-Japanese War between the Russian Empire and the Empire of Japan from 1904 to 1905 played a major role in tensions. Japan was the victor and the outcome changed the balance of power in Asia, with Japan becoming a major naval power. But for the most part, though, the victory in the Spanish-American War revealed a resurgence of American naval strength. By the time Roosevelt was inaugurated, there was a renewed affection for the U.S. Navy by the American people. In 1901, Theodore Roosevelt became the 26th president and the youngest at age 42 to serve after President McKinley was assassinated in September of that year. As president, he pursued his naval program with steely determination. He believed the most important policy of his presidency was to upgrade and expand the U.S. Navy. Roosevelt's love of the Navy, his strategies and policies were tremendously influenced by the officer and historian Alfred Thayer Mahan. He wrote over 20 books on naval history and sea power, but the most important volumes were The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, 1660 to 1783, and The Influence of Sea Power Upon the French Revolution and Empire, 1793 to 1812, which won immediate recognition both abroad and at home. It has been said that Mahan 
was the most important American strategist of the 19th century and today is recognized as the major prophet of sea power. Mahan believed that having a strong presence on the seas is one of the main reasons that help a country win wars and become an influential world power. He encouraged the U.S. to expand its naval power and project its power globally. With this, the U.S. would increase trade and prosperity and protect American business interests. President Roosevelt would put Mahan's theory into practice. At the close of the Jamestown Exposition in November 1907, the United States Battle Fleet, which had been anchored in the harbor during the exposition, returned to sea for battleship maneuvers and to home shipyards in preparation for their next assignment. One near and dear to President Theodore Roosevelt, supposedly a practice cruise to the Pacific. Roosevelt's vision and reasoning to send the new battle fleet around the world was multifaceted. Number one, the U.S. was keeping an eye on Japan. Roosevelt wanted to send a strong but peaceful message to Japan and other nations that the U.S. Navy could now move from the Atlantic coast to the Pacific and protect its interest anywhere around the globe. Number two, it was to test the strength and weaknesses of the ships, equipment, and sailors. It was imperative to take measure of the fleet while at peace instead of while the U.S. might be at war. The President also wanted to find out what condition the fleet would be in after such a transit. As he stated before the fleet's departure, I want all failures, blunders, and shortcomings to be made apparent in time of peace and not in time of war. Number three, Roosevelt thought that the voyage would assure the American people of the U.S. Navy's stability, preparedness, and strength. And number four, Roosevelt also believed that if the crews were successful, he would receive additional appropriations for more battleships that would help further achieve his naval policies. By the 1890s, the old wooden fleet had gradually faded away and modernization of the Navy had begun. The battleships assigned to the U.S. battle fleet represented the new Navy, with steel hulls, steam power, and long-range rifled guns. In addition, at the beginning of the 20th century, the organization of the battle fleet underwent a revolutionary change. For the first time, the ships of the U.S. Navy were concentrated in a few heavy units, rather than spread out in small squadrons all over the face of the earth. Between 1891 and 1905, approximately 25 new battleships were built. All the vessels were commissioned after the Spanish-American War. There were 16 battleships included in the fleet, and they were mainly painted white except for the gilded scroll work on their bows, with their superstructure painted a buff color. The fleet consisted of two squadrons of battleships. Each squadron had two divisions with four battleships each. The battleships were accompanied during the first leg of their voyage by a torpedo flotilla of six early destroyers as well as by several auxiliary ships. Let's go over a few battleship facts. Number one, ships were coal burning. They held approximately 2,000 tons of coal and burned 10 tons of coal per hour and produced very dense smoke and tons of ash. Number two, Ships had electricity, which was run by that coal. Number three, ships were able to make their own water. One ton of coal created seven tons of water. Four, the size of a battleship crew was approximately 827 officers and men. Five, ships steamed at various rates from eight to 13 knots, but the actual transit time was made at the average rate of 10 knots per hour. Number six, when in formation, they steam behind each other at precisely 400 yard intervals. Number seven, the ships all had wireless communications. 28 units of telegraph and telephone were installed before the fleet left Hampton Roads. And finally, number eight, the ships ranged in size from about 10,000 to 16,000 tons. By December 9, 1907, all the battleships returned to Hampton Roads. 
It was no surprise that President Roosevelt returned to the site of the Jamestown Exposition to send off the Atlantic Fleet on their goodwill journey around the world. On the morning of December 16th, the morning color ceremony were conducted and the ships were full dressed to pay tribute to President Roosevelt. A little after 8 a.m., the presidential yacht, the Mayflower, came into sight. All 16 battleships executed a simultaneous 21-gun salute. As the Mayflower continued into the harbor, a second gun salute from Fort Monroe was rendered. The yacht then proceeded to sail through in between the columns of the first and second squadrons. Of course, the scene was spectacular. There were bands playing, sailors manned the rails, and marine detachments paraded. As the Mayflower passed through the two squadrons, Roosevelt was so moved by the scene that he said to the Secretary of the Navy, did you ever see such a fleet? Isn't it magnificent? Aren't we all feel proud? As was the custom, Admiral Robley D. Evans, the fleet commander and other officers boarded the Mayflower for a meeting with the President. Shortly after the meeting, the Mayflower headed out preceding the battleships who were preparing to depart. The Mayflower anchored just outside the Chesapeake Bay so Roosevelt could watch the fleet as they departed. At 10 o'clock a.m., all 16 battleships moved into line, forming a long stately column flanked by the auxiliary ships as they left Hampton Roads and moved out toward the open sea. Once again, there was a 21-gun salute as they were passing the Mayflower. One can assume that Admiral Evans was extremely proud of his fleet. Earlier in the day, he had stated that his ships were ready at the drop of a hat for a feast, a frolic, or a fight. The journey to the Pacific had begun.